Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Johnny Stewart, welcome back to the podcast. Got yourself a dozer, big truck over there. Yeah, since I I got dozers. Oh yeah, I mean that fits. That it fits, fits your, me. It fits your lifestyle pretty good. I actually got a dozer just like that. Really? Yeah. What kind is it? It he says D thirteen on it. It's a cat, actually D six, but maybe he couldn't put that on there. Yeah. But I got one just like that. No, I don't push hops too often. And you know, you're not pushing hops. I push dirt. <laughs> oh man. So we are, we are at, we're just finishing up the mountain buck scouting camp here, the second annual now, which is wild to say. And, um, here, um, at, uh, Kip folks, who is the founder of big truck at his property here in Northern Pennsylvania, where we held the camp at and, uh, super thankful that, that he allowed me to use this place again, or for us to use this place again and be able to to do this because it was it was pretty incredible such such different weather than uh than we had last year <laughs> yeah last year was snowing this year what 75 yeah green yeah really stark contrast than last year i like the cooler weather yeah it was you know hiking weather last year but you can't you would think this time of year um you're gonna have some good weather but uh at least it wasn't raining how huh? it called for some rain and we lucked out of that, huh? Yeah, no, we uh, we definitely lucked out. I mean, it showed 30% chance of thunderstorms all day on Saturday. We never got a drop the whole time, which was, was really lucky. Um, yeah, last year we had snow, four inches of snow. I think we got overnight that yep, time. And, yeah. And uh, cold weather. And this time, you know, it was a good 40-some degrees warmer, <laughs> which is wild to, wild to think about. But such a good – such a good – uh time no matter what like that we had here we were able to have some outdoor fires and everything like it just made it just made it uh pretty enjoyable yeah it was nice having some of the guys stay with us unlike last year you know um that was really cool to you know talk hunting and hear hear stuff from them and it was i mean just overall all the people that attended were were great guys you know and it was easy to talk to them it was about hunting and, and stuff like that and like you said nobody was off or arrogant it, like it was it's everybody's it was a good time you know yeah no it uh so last year um for anyone that that doesn't know last year it was the first year I did it and we had it where people came in and it was a one and a half day workshop essentially that we had and and this year changed it up a little bit where we went full two days because we were kind of running out of time last year, which we ended up who could have used more time again this year too. It was, yeah. it's, it's so hard to condense all this in, in two days, but we added the option for what I just called the VIP membership slot. It was very limited. Um, only had a handful of people that stayed here. Um, got to stay at this lodge with us and get to have fully cooked meals from Gunnar Emberg, otherwise known as a hungry huntsman, mm-hmm. who he absolutely crushed. He kills it. Breakfast, lunch, dinner every single night. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a really great cook. Everything is wonderful. Yeah. No, it was it was so good and and the whole idea like behind and I think you're actually the one who brought up the idea last year about having some people stay with us is like to try to like really bring that deer camp vibe that we get to have mm-hmm. and bring it to people that either don't get to have that opportunity or maybe just want to have us some different people hang out with us and and uh for whatever reason but you know me you my dad mason mason martonic my cousin yeah we i told him 10 minutes before we started that he was going to be a presenter be this year front, yeah because i know mason gets nervous yeah and i know that he would he would still do it if uh if he didn't so that was that was nice to have him involved ryan glitzky otherwise known as moose, moose. so he went from being an attendee last year to coming mm-hmm. in and teaching a class this year which was really cool and uh greg litzinger bow hunting fiend he was back again and Kenny Kane on the forestry side. So like it was it was a good group. Like when 
you know, when I asked all of you guys, it kind of came down to everyone's got their strong suit and we all hunt a little differently. And I wanted that different perspective. So when people that are here and asking questions or getting that once we go out in the field and see inside, it's like, they're not, it's not just a, so they know that it's not just one way to hunt deer. There's everyone's thinking of things differently and we're learning from each other. And I think that, I think that's really helpful. Yeah. I think that is a huge thing is to have different as different people's perspective. And, um, cause if you were just the only guy up there talking, it would be more of just how you see it and how you hunt. And, and some people would take that as, as a matter of fact, this is how it's done, which, um, you have success doing things your way. Um, when you bring other personalities in and people, um, it's a, it's a different perspective. And I think like when these people, like when a question's asked, I think people are thinking a scenario that they have in their hunting spot. Uh, if they ask a general question and, and then I'm thinking the area I hunt, how I would answer it. And then you're thinking on an area that you would hunt. So it's nice to see different way, like answering it differently because you're thinking of a different kind of scenario. It's not like, um, we're like, everybody's hunting this property and knows this piece. And we're asking questions about this. It's like, they have their own image in their head of their area that they're hunting and they're wanting to question. And, and there are, maybe I would answer it wrong. Cause the th- situation I'm thinking of doesn't pertain to them to where you might be a better, uh, answer to, 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 for them, yep. it might help, or, or they might have three, them three, um, things to take and apply in their situation, you know, but, um, there's just so many, um, no two pieces of land are exact There's similarities, but there's big differences in, you know, habitat population we can go on and on about it, you know, yeah. so. No, and then, and what was cool too this year, one thing that changed and based off of feedback from last year was going and we pre scouted the areas. So, me and my dad came in and pre scouted, and we wanted two completely different areas uh, to be able to look at. So, one was a a piece of kind of mountain ground with some good terrain features, um, some open wood, some laurel, some oak, and that kind of stuff mixed in. And then the other area had a giant clear cut um, that had been cut probably about three years ago, had some hemlock, some more cherry, some other stuff, not as much oak and some mountain laurel mixed in. And just seeing how the deer use some of these different terrain features and vegetation types differently Mm -hmm. and understanding that and and uh so that was that was that was pretty cool to be able to to do that and then we split them up into groups you know so like me and you and and moose and kenny led one group and then my dad mason and greg led um another group there flip-flop yeah and then the people got the flip-flop between the two groups and get to see all of our different perspectives and and uh, get to see the different locations and it always like the way we structure it is there's a classroom portion in the morning kind of going through some Mm -hmm. of the basics of particular situations and then we just kind of almost treat it like a podcast like this where we're going back and forth and thinking of scenarios and giving options and allow you know giving the opportunity to anyone that's there to ask questions based on their situations and get, you know, feedback. And I felt like this class was super engaged, um, super engaged, asking a lot of questions, being able to do that. And, and it's funny, we were talking about it afterwards. Uh, was we were having kind of like, a, um, I don't know how to want to call it, but a, a session in the, in the kitchen afterwards of just kind of a recap. Mm-hmm, a re- and, yeah. and, and we were talking about what went well, you know, what could be improved. And there's always things to improve. We had a bunch of things that we think we can do better, but, it came down to there has not in the two years of doing this, there has not been one person that we're like, Oh, we're glad they're gone. Mm-hmm. Like everybody's like people Every, would yeah. be welcome to have in in our camp. In your own hunting camp, yeah. Yeah. That's 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 pretty cool. Yeah. Um and I think when we get out in the field a lot more guy I think some people in a classroom situation are afraid to actually ask questions to some degree or might think it's dumb, but um I think 
once we got out in the field or in in breaks, they would come up to one of us and, and pick our brain, which is, is um, good because I, I know a lot of them probably had questions, but they just didn't want to ask. They'd rather just like pull you aside. And, and then how I talked about um, the question they would ask in a classroom and their situation. Then once we go out in the field, then we are actually in all in the same situation you know and then they're gonna ask questions and um based on what we're seeing you know not just in a classroom and a lot of guys would you know when we get out in the field okay what would you how would you hunt this and that and um i think that that was a big um help to people i think a biggest thing i got asked a lot was um how, how do you approach it what's your entrance exit you know i feel like that was a a really um, concern, a big concern for a lot of these guys. Once you find a situation, how do you get in? So I'm, I'm, I think I helped a few guys out with that. And, um, yeah. And, and that's, a. but, um, yeah, this is, so Kurt, Kurt, my brother, Kurt was here helping out and tagging along with both groups. And he said that the top questions that he heard that came to all of us on both sides where once we found specific sign, it was, what do you look for next? That was a big question. Would you set up a camera and how? Would you hunt this and how, which goes to the point that you said there. How do you know where to stop? That was mm -hmm. a big one. Like when, when do you know, like when you're finding fresh sign and being able to do that and then access. Those mm -hmm. were the top like five things that seemed to come up. And, you know, there was there's not really one way to answer any of that. And mm -hmm. I think that was important for them to, to be able to see. And, you know, even for, for myself is like, my eyes were opened up so much to, again, like I, I've spent a lot of time in the woods with you, mm -hmm. but yet every time we spend time together, I learn more or see how you look at something a yeah. little differently and something that I'm like, man, I might, I might put some time into this spot. You, there was times you're like, no, I wouldn't waste my time here. I, I would keep going. And it was just like, it was interesting. And then you'd be like, and this is why, mm -hmm. and this is why. And like, I think, you know, kind of looking at the, the question of like, what do you do next when you find hot sign? Like, what are the things that go through your head when you find a, say you find a, a nice scrape, what are like the things that you think about? Um, you find a nice scrape and uh, hopefully I have a camera to get it on here immediately, um, to start getting some pictures or whatever um i always think i think a high percentage of these scrapes are hit at night not always it depending on i guess location you know if it's yeah. like where we checked out one near the road me and you um i wasn't getting a lot of mature deer because it was by the road um so in that situation i'm like where is he because i figure he's going to come here at night um scrape um, then I always start thinking, which way is he going to come? Where's he coming from? But knowing your area enough can help you. Where is, um, the cover, where's the food? You just put the pieces of uh, the puzzle together to help him. Where, where are the does bedding, you know? Um, but also like when you see a scrape, is this a scrape that I feel like a mature deer is going to hit? Like I said, if it, was, it was that one by the road. I felt that, um, after I ran a camera, just a mature deer, cause it was, cars it just then that situation and i don't want to contradict myself because there are times when these bucks live by the road you know yeah but, um um but but you didn't you wouldn't have known that and you kind of thought that they might have but then running a camera then there, running a camera t told me told you it was more immature deer um well and, and the thing you said about location like th that is that is a critical component i think all of us were very aligned with that like um when we found Say we go up and we found, say, for example, the, the point we were going up today and yesterday. So we'd found a really heavy trail crossing in the bottom, which is something that I'll do a lot is when I find some heavy trail crossings going from point to point, that makes me like want to walk up and check that out. Mm -hmm. You know, like sign in the bottom show up so much more than on top. It's, you know, it's a little bit softer down there. You can see sign a little better. You can see trails. And, uh, so we went up on this point and we started getting into some scrapes about a third of the way up, you know, there was a pretty good looking scrape there. And I think both you and I said, we'd probably throw a camera at it. But the first thing we thought of was we looked around 
and looked at the area. Okay, does a buck feel safe here? You know, that's one thing you think about, like when you're thinking of daylight activity and scrapes. Like yeah. what? It was pretty open woods. You know, it was and, like, and another thing that's really important is, can I hunt this scrape? Is this a situation that I can set up on and hunt? Because the majority of the deer are going to come in with the wind in their favor. You know, so that's a that's a big thing. Is is there something? Is there like a uh, is it like on a point? Do you think he's more more or less come in like to where your wind, you can just have the wind a little bit in your favor to catch him maybe coming like this and the wind's going like that, you know what I mean? But there are some situations where scrapes, you're just like, man, I, I don't think I can hunt this because I just think he's going to smell me, you know, because they're, they're on alert. I think sometimes I'd, I'm not crazy about scrapes just because, man, they're, they're on alert when they're coming in. They're going to smell w- not so much you, but what other animals hit that with the deer deer hit that and um they're going to be using their nose right off the bat when they come into that scrape so maybe you have to set up a little ways away so that's is it something is it a scrape that i can hunt i guess you know that's a that's a big question to ask yourself yeah no definitely and and but you know like again at that example you know we'd found this big licking branch which is something i always look for Mm -hmm. to determine that you know a mature buck is is working this scrape big big spot on the ground that was pawed out and it was actually even looked like it was hit somewhat recently but if you just look at the rest of the stuff that we'd found at that point not much sign other than the trail coming up the hill not much other buck sign there but then all of a sudden we started finding you know some some decent sized saplings that were snapped in half mm-hmm. like, okay there's probably a mature buck in here but when you looked at it it was kind of open the the look like the primary food in this particular situation there at this place that we were at there was a food plot in the bottom which but if you look at that from a scenario in public that could either be sometimes there's a lot of those bottoms that are grassy that they're coming down to at night and they're feeding in some of those creek bottom spots or private ag fields that are down at the bottom they're bedding up high and coming yep. down to it so we're like this is a travel area probably not a spot we're gonna hunt we're gonna keep going we're gonna mm-hmm. keep pushing as we started moving up the hill it started getting a little better a little better, some yeah. thicker cover, some green briar, some, um, uh, there was some laurel. We got to the laurel. Yeah. We, then we got up, we got up, but what was, this was a really cool part of it. We got up, there was like a, a knob or a hill that was on top. And then we were coming up the point and there were just trails coming around on both sides and right where that met. That's a good train feature, but it still wasn't great yet. And then Yesterday we had missed it, but today we spotted this rub that was just kind of off mm-hmm. on this like off trail. It wasn't the main trail. So we walked over and checked that out. And Moose is like, oh, this is a little faint trail. It's coming around. And based off a of bed, we had found kind of inside that laurel a little bit that looked like it might have been a buck bed yesterday. He's like, that'd be perfect for that buck to J hook up and head up toward yep. that bed. Mm-hmm. And you know, yesterday we were like, eh, this, the sign's not really looking that great. And what we were kind of looking at for a potential setup completely changed when we went in there again and just found another piece to the puzzle. Mm-hmm. And I think that, like, when you're looking at that type of situation, and we're, and I think, I, I feel like the attendees that were here and the guys that were here started to see that, like, not everything, no matter how much we've scouted, not everything's clear to us the first time we go yeah. in. We're just going through, you know, Moose was, was big on marking every piece of sign yep. you find in Spartan Forge, marking that sign. And then after you have all the sign marked, you start seeing trends and travel routes. And then it might take the second time going in or the third time to really kind of get a better picture for it. Yeah, and the second day up, I was, I was feeling better about where we were with the Laurel. And I feel like like you mentioned, and it stuck with me, which is true, like, sign is just relative to where you're at like how much sign you see like initially when i went up there i'm like there's not much sign here but what what does that mean you know if you don't have something like i'm I'm thinking of some of the areas i have maybe have more sign but once we were in the laurel and we were around i was like it, it ain't there's some decent sign here like it, it went from there's not a lot here to it's decent because i put i kept going we kept scouting and knowing more and like after you talked about this other hill not having as much sign and open, and I said, well, this might be, this is looking better to me just after it went from not so great to this is better because that, that might be the best that you're going to find, you know, and that's, you only know that by putting, like you said, a, a few trips in or encompassing larger areas, 
um, it might be like, wow, this is the best spot to hunt. It might go from like, yeah, because that first trip, I'm like, I wasn't excited. You know, I wasn't seen. And then I, I said, okay. And then once we got to that, um, after the laurel, we got to a saddle where you had to scrape. And then leaving that, we found some faint scrapes and then hit. Uh, it was a pretty hardcore trail. Um, it felt like there was kind of a steep hill coming up. And then there's just like a transition of um, slope to where it was kind of sl- steep and then it, it transitioned to a lesser slope and there was a, a top there and it, it was uh, a, a definitely a, right at that transition the deer were traveling along there like on a topo line right there and probably heading to that saddle a nice um, more or less a funnel but there was a like I felt good um, like I put myself in a deer's situation where there were some grape vines there was a little bit of thick stuff there was a little the ground was uneven and i just feel like i could s- catch him sneaking through there um and then it made after seeing that it made that that scrape and then then the the cover the uh, laurel look better because i'm starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together and once you find more you can and i'm always hesitant when i go into a situation like i did yesterday to start giving advice and saying this which i'm, I'm I don't know. I'm not ready to give you an answer on how I would hunt or what it's, it's, you know, um, I don't want people to say, John said to do this. And then after I put the time in, it's like, uh, no, like initially was, I wasn't too excited about it. Yeah. Maybe it always throw maybe in there because I don't know enough to, to say, um, this is what I would do. I want to see more and I can kind of give for an instance, like when guys would talk to me, I'm like, um, well, if you know this deer, if you if you would know this laurel is is where does are, and if you knew the opposite side was maybe thick and he's laying on that point, then yes, I would be here. I was like adding to what we saw, like adding another um, point of interest to where he was going from the you know from maybe that point to here, but just going up there and seeing it, like I I was kind of lost a little bit on on how to answer some questions you know what i mean yeah no and 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 it takes like you said those pieces of the puzzle like i felt like by the end of today we felt way better about the situation and had ideas in our head of what made sense versus the first time you look at it and and as you're going up you don't you don't know what's good until you see most of it and what you said was really important about deer sign being relative like to your areas like you know, I, I struggle with this a lot too. And, and, and you were saying that you were today too, was like when you're in a different area, it takes a while and seeing a bunch of the property to understand what good deer sign mm-hmm. looks like in your area, because the areas that you're used to hunting might have more deer sign or less deer sign. So you might get, say you're in an area that has less deer sign. You go to an area that has more, you think everything looks good. Yeah. And that's yep. not good either. Yeah. You know, cause it's, it's, it's more difficult to be able to figure that out, but one thing that that really stuck with me from scouting this place and others, and Greg Litzinger is huge on this, is finding sign on specific topography. You know, like as far as on a, a topo line at a certain elevation, you start finding, you're starting to figure out travel routes of some of these bucks mm-hmm. based on the sign that they're leaving. And I think we found some of that today where when we first found that one rub up towards the edge of that laurel and then where the travel was through the laurel that came out the same elevation yeah. as this giant community scrape that was in the middle of a saddle mm-hmm. and that scrape so put that scenario on public land and there's probably going to be a ladder stand in that saddle yeah you're right because everyone knows about saddles they're great but at the same time there's always pressure there so how do you work off that saddle still paying attention to mm-hmm. it and that's where, like, following that topography line out and finding some of these spots that that are, you know, have a little more cover, like the mountain laurel and stuff, where you can set up, you know, there's not really a, a defined distance. It could be 150 yards. It could be 500 yards away. But that still plays off of that same, you know, type of location. And I think, you know, we were finding a lot of that. Yeah, definitely. That, that elevation, um, once we saw that, I'd say – the saddle and then a trail leaving and then that elevation um at the laurel thicket made that elevation look better the laurel thicket goes up probably 100 feet you know where do i hunt in here 
because a deer could potentially be anywhere in that laurel thicket. But then once you start picking up them, like when Moose found him, you know, that trail going in, I'm like, okay, this is, I probably hang down about this elevation, yeah. you know, or work my way in, um, whether you start high, you know, if the thermals are coming up and just work your way down to that area. But yeah, it made more sense to be uh, down lower, you know, but it's just time hiking. And like Moose said, find them little clues. There's, a, there's, and I always talk about like something's happening here. There's clues everywhere, you know, um, you just got to figure it out. Um, yeah. And, and, and making a lot of assumptions based off of what you're seeing, but there's such little sign that, that we are picking up on that I, I think is, it's easy to walk past. Like, so we found a good bed at one point towards the bottom of the laurel and it was kind of difficult to tell if it was a buck bed or a doe bed. I mean, it was a good size. There was some hair in it and it was, but it was wore down pretty good. And there was one bed. And to me, that was like, there wasn't any rubbed right there, but on that same elevation line on one of the exit trails, there was a scrape about 80 yards away. There was some rubs mm -hmm. there. And then you started looking around and there was some bushes that were coming through the laurel that were just like, had, tine marks on them that weren't really hit as a rub but kind of you know ticked up a little yeah, bit yeah yeah and it made it made you think like okay now i'm going to draw a conclusion and say that is a spot that that buck could be bedded in this location and that's not a that's not a fact that's just a, a conclusion mm -hmm. we came to based off of the other sign that we were finding there and and that's where you like picking up on those little things and mason talked a lot about tracks mason uses tracks yeah. a lot for confirming stuff as far as where a buck is going to move through you know just as much as trail camera knowledge or anything else and it's like there's not one little thing to look at it's finding all these pieces and sometimes it's just slowing down and taking your time going through these places yeah definitely i'm I'm always and i notice myself i'm always looking like this like eyes up down because like, there's so much to see and take in and like we were talking about that elevation line i feel like these bucks after tracking enough deer and some rugged areas like we were today was maybe what three to four hundred from bottom to top you're thinking elevation change Bo? I, I didn't really look at the map i think it was five to six hundred was it that much yeah okay so that's a fairly large or er, mountain we would call yeah. it and uh i find that there is that sweet spot that them bucks like to be and, I, and after following deer in this type of terrain um in the snow it's kind of like they're using that taut that there's that sweet spot they might go up a little bit and down but it's just kind of like this you know and use it use that top o line but just plus or minus a little bit they kind of feel comfortable in you know just as a general rule of thumb now you can't say oh johnny said is you know like um maybe the tops that flat got a ton of acorns and maybe they'll be up there but then that's another we didn't never we didn't go to the top to see you know um Moose Moose did that first day. He took that little that group up there. Yeah, we were standing there looking at a spot that last year when we scouted this area, there was a big scrape there, and, a, and it was a pretty good little trail. It went in the laurel, a little tiny bench, and you can only really see it when you have slope angle turned on mm -hmm. and ten foot contours on your map because it was such a small little thing, but it was a trail, and I didn't even have the words. This is a good exit trail out of my mouth. Yeah. And they kicked up some deer off the top of the hill. And we don't know if it was a, a buck that, you know, lost its antlers or a big doe. But she came running out and almost ran over. Uh, our group like, came flying out right on that exit trail. It was like, okay, that's an escape route, too, for them. Like, you kind of, we learned yeah, that. Yeah. And it, it that gave us a little bit of of uh, clarity on that spot, too, and, and being able to see that. But it's like, you know, we it takes just walking some of these different elevations and and my dad said it pretty good he was like if you have like a day to scout something you know there's you're gonna miss stuff there's yeah. there's highlights that you can do and you can get in a good place guys that are short on time you can do well in one day but to really know an area you gotta walk it all like yeah. you gotta when you find a good spot it's time to like grid the different elevation levels and really understand how they're using that property and, and for like a lot of people even like me that don't live near where they're hunting um scout 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 no and i always talk about knowing no no more keep knowing i don't care if i'm and i told a lot of these guys i don't a lot of guys are scared to get in and thoroughly go through and check it i was like i'd rather know 
that's a good area and bump a deer out of it than to sit here and not get into that situation that I would want to hunt. Um, just, just know as much as you can go through it. Um, it, yeah, that's, that's really important. You know, take, uh, if you're going out for two or three days hunting, maybe, and I've talked about times where I would go to a piece of land that, and just walk, just hike, speed, hike, walk, go through it. And especially if there's a lot of hunters, they're going to usually tend to use the same stands and stuff like that. Just speed, hike through it and take up. And I've done it and even like in the gray light areas in the evening when deer are moving and I'll see where guys or stands are, no deer sign. And then boom, here's, here's a, I bumped a doe here and it's just like, okay, these, these deer, you, and, and I always say that you walking and hiking is not, doesn't put them on edge as much as when you're a hunter and you're acting like a predator by sitting up in your stand, they can't see you you're hidden i mean that to me that's like bad juju like i'd rather hike and make noise and walk and bump deer that way because they're a little calmer when when they run off and listen to you go off and they just come back you know so that's all i always say is get in there and hike it and make some noise and scout and then hunting can be that if you tip them off in a hunting situation like i talked about where this last year i got it in my stand before light and uh i heard a deer running a buck chasing a doe below me and i hit my grunt call just one time I, I i blew on it and it was an hour before daylight and um the the ground was wet so here this buck ended up coming up the hill and standing 40 yards from me i'm sitting in my stand still an hour a light before light and then I, I got up and just turned around and my safety belt or just made a noise on my my uh hood and it was a foreign noise and he already had that spot pegged because i grunted and um, he blew and he run down that hill like that's he didn't like he did not like that like that was way worse than if i just hiked in there and bumped him he'd run and do a circle i feel like i could hunt that area again but what i did really threw me off and i'm like i really effed this spot up i need to reevaluate like I wouldn't even hunt there. I actually gave it a couple of days and I moved because I think he was really in tune to what I was. It was on public land. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So know what you like, and, know and, as much as you can. Yeah. And, and another thing you brought up about walking and, and not worrying as much about, you know, really destroying an area, you know, per se. And people do worry about that. And I saw that through a lot of the questions that came up. They're worried about going a little further and bumping deer you're on public land. There's probably yeah. people that have Are already. already walking through those places. I mean, I was very cautious at times. Like I remember I'd be waiting for the perfect scenario all the time to go in and do this. And, and in reality there is, and then I'd like check my cameras and I got guys with bird dogs in front of it. And I got, there's people walking through the woods a lot. Yeah. So these like, mature deer are already onto the game. They know it. They know where the, they know it. Yeah. There's humans out there, and they basically they live with humans in, in in these public lands, not so much on like private land. Um, guys stay out and stuff like that. But these deer are surviving, living with humans. Um, people are afraid to go in and walk, or afraid of leaving scent. I mean, and then I, I talked earlier uh, in the class about you don't know exactly when you got a lot of flat area, no topo, and and not much concentration of food. You don't know how these deer na these deer navigate. Like, they just roam. How how you know you're gonna say I I don't want to walk where he can um, catch my scent from my boots or my my trail in and out. I really don't know. You know, in these big big air big public lands mountains, like I really I don't know everything. And I what I'm saying is I don't know exactly where he's gonna walk. You know what I mean? To, yeah. to, you know, maybe when you get like so when you get around a scrape, wear your gloves um rubber boots and stuff like that because he's you know he's going to come to that spot so try to not leave as much scent there but in general um just do do your best with have a pair of shoes that um you wear in the field a lot and there doesn't have a new smell to them maybe rubber boots and I, there's times when i just cake mud on them when i'm when i have the chance and let it sit on there and I don't think we talked much. I mean, it is a scouting camp, so I guess scent control is a, is a big thing f for me. I don't know. We should have touched on that a little bit. Um, 
because I know some people don't worry about it. Some people are fanatics about it. Um, and, and I think it's an important thing to, to keep your scent to a minimum. Um, wash your clothes. Um, wash your body. Um, when, when you're going out hunting, you know, I feel like you're putting off scent, but if you can just minimize the amount of scent that's leaving your your body, that can help where um, we should have maybe touched a little bit more on, on that as far as yeah. when you get into a hunting situation. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, it's a scouting camp, so, I mean, yeah, you gotta you, be, and then you say we already did two days. and You got to be focused. Like, it's it's hard. Like, there's there's definitely so much, you know, meat left on the bone as far as, like, what we could have covered, but – to I feel like for and you can only retain so much information. So like, you know, in in a short amount of time, I think Kurt was saying like in something like this, you're probably only someone is probably only retaining ten to fifteen percent of what they heard during that. So I feel like like staying focused on the topic of scouting and mm-hmm. yeah, once we get in the field, it comes hand in hand as far as how we're gonna set up and doing that. But like actual deer tactics and strategy yeah. wasn't as much of That's a whole nother camp. That's, that's a whole nother camp. Yeah. That's a hunt you know what I mean? Because you could you could have another two days just on that I mean, and go into get, the yeah. the scent control. And like I've I've never been a I shouldn't say never have been, but in the last five to six years I haven't been big on scent control or taking precautions with that and now i can do i can 100 percent do better and there was mm-hmm. one thing that you guys both said that i thought that i should do better is like i i can't wear rubber boots really because i just like i don't know my ankles support and sometimes yeah. it's deep country and and also my feet sweat so bad mm-hmm. all those things like so what can i do to still minimize it even though i can't go to that level and it's maybe just my my boots and my leather boots that i'm wearing just only use those for hunting or like moose was saying he keeps them you know in his truck he takes them off he when t- he gets to his vehicle yeah he takes them off when he gets to his vehicle and he wears a different set you know when he's walking and you know and that that's that. a great definitely like if you got floor mats and your armor on them and you're sitting in there and you're hunting then you're going out it was like you got to think about all that stuff now i i have an excavation but i'm out in the dirt all day and my floor is covered in dirt so it's actually just like i'm just wearing you know yeah. what i mean it's kind of like <laughs> Uh, so think about all that stuff, you know, um, and the rubber glove thing too, with the licking branch, I've never done that. Yeah, me either. And, um, but that was something I was like, that could be that, that 100% is not going to hurt you. It mm-hmm. only has a potential to help you. And I thought that was a good point that Moose brought up with it. Cause I just go up and I grab the branch and I break it off and, um, and then I spray it down with forehead gland scent and do bucks still hit them. Yeah. But maybe there are bucks that smell me and they i'm not even getting pictures of them because i'm doing that i don't know and sometimes i uh i've even told some of these guys i'll just if you got mud nearby I'll, i mean i'll go off away from the scrape move the leaves cover my hands and mud and, and and that just to, if i do want to break that branch yeah i've watched you do that before yeah to help cover you know that that scent and it would almost smell like earth so it coincides with what he's expecting to smell in that area you know what i mean yeah no, and, 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 but back to like the scouting portion of it, it's like we kept saying it over and over again. It takes years to learn an area, no matter how skilled you are, how much experience that you have. It takes a while to learn intricacies of these specific areas. And the things that we talk about are rules of thumb. And the way I put it, it gets you 70% of the way there. Mm-hmm. And then, 30% is figuring out that specific area and and how the deer are using these these spots like mature bucks are mature bucks no matter where they're at in the country whether they're in the suburbs where Lee Ellis hunts or they're in the mountains where we hunt but now it's like when you're in these locations understanding how they're you know trying to pay attention to their security what are they using for that what and, you know, cover's relative, too. That was something else we talked about. You know, when you talk about cover, you, you hear that all the time. We say that all the time. What does that actually mean? What is cover? Yeah. If you're in an area with that is very mature timber, open woods, and you find a spot that has some uh, grape, grape like vines, vines dead that log. are over it and, yeah. and a little patch of or dead log or blowdown, that might, be all. That, that might be all the cover. That might be the cover you're looking for. You get another area that, you know, you have uh, – a giant sized 
you know, eight year old clear cut that's thick as can be everywhere, there's different things on what cover yeah. looks like in, in that potential location versus what you're finding in these other places. And that just takes, again, walking these areas and being able to see it. Now, e-scouting, it, it, we spent a lot of time going through e-scouting and terrain features. What that's meant to do is get you in the game, is mm -hmm. to be able to help you do it. And, but nothing replaces in the field scouting. And now you're saying, okay, say you're trying to go to Ohio and you've never been there before. You don't have time to get out there ahead of time. You have seven days to hunt. That's why. I, that's where when I go out in those situations, I'm going to spend two, three days scouting, even though that's taken away from hunting time. But it, I feel like I'll be in the game more than if I were just to go try to sit in a tree for seven days. Oh yeah, definitely. And I've lately, as I teach and talk to people, I start telling using the word like a an area I consider a safe zone for mature deer. So, so that really. Um, there could be a lot of things to make a deer feel safe, a mature deer, whether it's cover or terrain. Um, but to me, a safe zone is where he pretty much can go and live daylight hours that he's not been bumped in his very often three to four, five years. And he can kind of let his guard down a little bit, um, and a lot comes into play, whether, you know, it's a, it's a rugged area that he goes to, to no one goes, or, um, maybe it could be a safe zone near a parking or road that, that no one really messes with because it is, is by the road. But to me, when I say that safe zone, it could, you, you, uh, got the tools from like the camp or whatever you, you figure out where this deer's safe, this mature deer safe zone is because it could be a combination of things um but to me it's 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 an area that he, that he feels comfortable in and doesn't have the hunting pressure and he can let his guard down and, and and if it might be a pocket here it might be half a mile he got these safe zones that you know he can hop around to and i'm and like this year i'm going to start now and i try to stay i try to stay ahead of the game, the hunting game, the more people hunting the public land, the more shed hunters, what's his next move like to, to keep surviving. Um, I try to, um, put the, put all these pieces of the puzzle together, just these safe areas that a mature deer, you know, he's six, eight years old and there's a ton of rifle hunters. And then next year he pops up again, you know, where is this? It might be hard to find. There might not be a lot of he might not leave um sign in these areas but just if you if you start knowing the area where the guys hunt and stuff like that you could start figuring this could be a safe area and like this year i think what i want to do with these areas that i'm finding is i want to hunt when the guys the other hunters are out there that it, the the first week of november into the second week now this year i didn't really use that tactic it's starting i'm, I'm learning myself as i go in the hunting hunting these whitetails and I'm in an area where like this year, you know, it was a weird, weird year for the rut or some warm weather, but I'm, I'm hunting the traditional sign, you know, and, and I'm not seeing all the daylight activity that I want now. And there's still other hunters in the area. Now I feel like these mature deer, you get into November, they're still staying tight to these safe zones. And, and I even talked to a couple guys today about how I've seen them hang out in the safe area until about november 10th 12th because they're not dumb you know they survived a few ruts already um and it's like th they'll leave when you get in the rut they'll they'll be in their safe zone and then they'll leave 20 minutes before dark and you got that first 20 minutes and it's usually a beeline you know the guys ask me is he going into the wind that i said no he's so safe that he's just that first 20 minutes he's doing it with his guard down to some degree because this works he never sees people here so i'm going to start hunting um i'm thinking an area in particular that um i know where the hunters are and like i said when you get into november the guys are flooding the woods and these mature deer that grew up in these situations and survived with hunters and pressure um it's it's easy for them. They find these safe areas. And so I want to get in, I might even eliminate cameras to some degree. Cause I know the area enough. I might, 
I'm thinking about putting cameras out in the summer and getting an inventory what's left over from last year. I know some of them uh, made it through. I got pictures of them in December, but I'm just like, hey, when these guys, I'm not talking like middle, beginning, middle October, still green and up and forth. They could be, a, their safe zone might be larger because they don't see people that time. And it might be a relative to the time of year. You know, you get in that November, end of October, that, you know, their safe zone. And I'm just, I'm going to use the saddle this year and just get in these safe areas you know, where I know, and, and like I said, I try to see what they see. And the more time I I put in scouting and being around deer, I see where they don't go. From my scouting, my cameras, you know, and, and then I start to see where they want to be. Um, it, it, might, it might not even have sign or um, they, they might leave their safe area and get out and, and, and do their putting their rubs down and, and me t- talking to people and people asking me questions it helps me l- learn myself when I when I give them an answer and I'm like oh light bulbs go off for me too because um, I really start ask when they ask a question I want to give them the best answer I can and I really ask my, myself you know um, and, I'm, and I'm coming up with things like this that like and I even thought about it when I before I come to the camp I was at my place and I said I'm just going to go to these safe areas and take the saddle, get in a tree. And, and I feel like even these safe areas are going to, you know, and you get into October um, and they're, they're still putting a feed bag on. They're eating to some degree. Uh, so they're going to be moving. Um, maybe like you said, if there's a lot of browse, it might be in smaller situations. I mean, smaller areas to where they're going to feed. But if you can get in there, you can catch them, you know. Um, but being out where sometimes where all the sign is, is not the ideal place to catch these mature deer you know what i mean what so what do you mean uh, when you're talking about their safe areas what makes you feel like this is there any like tendency okay to even give a specific scenario like the scenario you're thinking of what makes you think that's their safe area i know you're saying that like okay you're playing off of human pressure um really probably the most part of it is playing yeah that's the biggest pressure i don't see people like and then people ask me do you see a lot of cameras and as things start clicking no, but I'm starting to gravitate to areas that people aren't in. And like you said, and I always tell people, I'll, people ask in the past, as Bo Martin, where's a buck bed where people aren't? Boom. Okay, I need to be where people aren't. You see the stands, you see the cameras, and they're usually, and then these bucks live by association. So if in my area there's a few clear cuts, yeah, the, the larger population of deer, will be there the um the majority of deer but they're going to be the younger age class deer does and and what have you um but then he's going to go in at night leave sign and da, da, da. so it all is appealing and looks good and, and i feel like once a buck uh smells someone in that area that situation he associates that maybe there's another clear cut a half a mile away um he goes into that area with more caution you know because this situation where I start seeing a lot of does and a lot of brows is where I start seeing humans. Yeah. You know, so it's like, so I'll go down a mile down the street or whatever. And I find this again, I'm already on red alert. This is where humans are, you know, and if, if, you know, rubs and scrapes and so they're going to be there at night, you know, cause they're going to be cautious, but, um, pretty much where people aren't, you know, but still have, what they need a lot of our areas that we hunt is browsing like you said it could be anywhere but um maybe a little you know when when the wind or the thermals might also help them throughout the day but um and, and it could be i mean it's it's vast in, in the area I, I hunt but knowing where they're they aren't you know uh helps you decide where they are and it don't always have to be but this is all relative again you know comes down to hunting pressure and i usually well, get close to hunting hunters and, and help that use that to help me you know you know I, I i learned something today from one of the attendees in the class that i thought was super helpful and and so when i when i find hunter sign like a tree stand or trail camera i mark it but what but one of the guys in the class was saying is he marks that in a specific color so yeah, and he marks that every piece of hunter sign that he finds. Where I'm marking stands and cameras, but I'm not really marking 
you know, some other things, maybe some glow tacks that are going mm-hmm. in or like trails that they might be using or there's some other things that can be and changing it to a different color. So when you look at your map, you know, when you're scouting, you're not just scouting the deer, you're scouting the people. And now you're starting to see, okay, here's a cluster where people are and and you know, here's some deer sign, which, you know, obviously is, is super important too, but you you can start adding more pieces to help build yeah, that puzzle definitely. and maybe even find that that safe area that you're talking yeah, about, yeah. that mystical safe area because Safe areas aren't like a terrain feature. They're not of certain vegetation. It's not something that you can just say, hey, Bo, here's four things that, you know, w- what would make up a buck safe area because it really it comes down to what's going to make them feel secure. Mm-hmm. That's that's what it comes down to. Yeah. And where is that location? But a lot of that's going to come from from, you know, figuring out what the humans are doing, what they're, what the pressure is being applied to their routes in what they're doing. And, you know, I've learned you, you pay attention to people for a while as far as uh, that. And that's something that I I think that I've paid attention to, but not as much as I should. Mm -hmm. And I think I got burned a little bit this year on that. And because I had historical information in this area of bucks doing certain things and I didn't spend enough time the beginning of the season really scouting some of these other areas around knowing that they're not knowing that there was more hunting pressure that moved in that kind of shifted yeah. things and it changed things and i burned some days on hunting deer that were non-existent in that spot during daylight because it wasn't it wasn't their safe zone anymore yeah and i always talk about the pressure as being the unknown variable you don't know what it is um it changes year to year so there's instances where there was pressure and the deer were void of that area and you kind of like, ah, you know, hunting there because guys are there. And then you end up dropping a camera. I send my buddy in there. Oh, I've seen all kind of bucks. And it's like, any sign of guys? No, ain't nobody in there. You know, so it just might be year to year to, you gotta, you gotta, you know, keep up with the hunting pressure. Yeah. Which is, you know, a, a whole another aspect besides finding the deer sign and, maybe on private land and, and knowing what's a good spot. Um, you got to keep up on that where the hunters are and help you. Like I said, there's times when I find good sign and, you know, you first thing you do is start looking for, it's, it's almost too good to be true. I'm like, there's got to be someone hunting here or, you know, you, I'll just throw cameras up. I won't instantly hunt it till if I get some daylight, I okay, then there must not be anybody hunting here. This is uh this is the real McCoy, you know, they're, yeah, they're actually and, coming in. And you, and you just made a good point. You're not always going to see hunter sign exactly because it is kind of an unknown variable, especially with people doing more mobile hunting, you know, yeah, like you're right. you do, you know, hunting from a you saddle. Much. Climbers, you can see marks and trees a little bit, but they're still not as easy to identify if you're not really looking at it that much or hanging hunt setups in general. Like that's, that's harder to be able to see um, than, you know, a traditional fixed ladder stand or hang on that's, put in the tree and left there all year. So it's, it's, you know, like I, I ran into a guy in this place that I was hunting and he knew I was in there. I knew he was in there. He's like, and he had stands all over. And he's like, he's like, I, I don't know where you're at. He's like, I can't like, where are you hunting at? Where are your stands at? I was like, I don't have any up. And he's like, what? I was like, yeah, I, yeah, I tear yeah. it down all the time. So he has no idea you yeah. know, where I'm at. And no, for, if he was trying to play off pressure, he'd have no idea besides that, you know, maybe you'd find my cameras. That'd probably be mm-hmm. the, the biggest, you know, indicator of that. But that that's so it's it's funny and when you, you think about it that way it's 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 kinda hard to 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 know that. Yeah, it um, is to be able to understand it. But scouting, you know, during season and stuff can help you so much with that. And another thing I wanna put on you talk about areas changing year to year, you know, the spot we scouted again here at the scouting camp, um, this is fresh in my mind. But last year this spot was so dynamite yep. as far as sign. And this year we ended up finding good sign, but it was not what it looked like last mm-hmm. year. And it's like last year was an off year. Like I, I have, I've struggled finding as good a sign this spring um, than I had the previous years in some spots. And that, But that also doesn't mean that that spot is bad. So like when you have an off year, you have hot weather during some of the sign leaving time, you know, when scrapes are the most active and rubs, you know, around yeah. that rut time period. That's where that historical sign, those older rubs that you're starting to see, some of the old licking branches that are broke, 
can play a role in that 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 I wouldn't just give up on that mm-hmm. area. Yeah. It's not like it's just all of a sudden bad, but I'm also not going to be like all in on it, you know, especially if it's a newer spot. I might throw some cameras at it and just test it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and see. But there's there's not exactly like a a rule book exactly on that on it's just a lot of testing and and being able to, and that's why I I have so many areas that I have scouted and have in my you know hunt plan as far as places to that I can go to and hunt because those variables change and sometimes yeah. they change so much that the area isn't worth hunting that year yeah. anymore and areas you want to get some odds in your favor so you're going to move on and it gets down to a certain percentage we don't exactly know I, my odds are low here let's let's move to another yeah you, you you brought up something i just came to my head that was so good when you were talking about we we're talking about confidence when you're going into spots and, yeah and setups and how when you're in the season you can get in your own head when things aren't going your way and you start thinking negatively but if you can like subjectively think of these things and write a pros and cons list basically or mm-hmm. positive and negatives yeah and you you were saying keep it simple when the negatives outweigh the positives, maybe it's yep. time to move on. Mm-hmm. But but you have to kind of like take your emotions to ground zero and think of it. And be honest with yourself and the situation you're in. Yes. You know, I'm not so good that I don't spook the deer or I don't mess the... Sp- John, did you think, okay, like in that situation where I jumped that buck before light, okay, uh, that was a big one. That's a big negative con, you know, that... But yeah, so I think right there, I, I was decided I need to move, just move transition a little further. But yeah, you can get it. You can get like I talked about how um, you do all your scout and you put all your time in. I'm in the right spot. This is where I need to be hunting this year or this time of year. And you sit there and day goes by, you don't see them, and then you start the pessimism by human nature comes into your head. Maybe I messed this. You start putting things out there for giving yourself answers why you're not seeing deer you know what i mean but then then also look at it um as the positives you know don't okay i'm not seeing deer for for a b or c but then um i still have an opportunity because then i what i've looked at a lot when i'm sitting my tree stand well and, and a quote i said before is like the longer I sit here and don't see a deer brings me closer to the time I will see a deer. And that like, okay, time just keeps, something's going to come by eventually. So yeah. that's a good way to, to see it, you know. And and, and so I'll, I'll give an example of this past year. And I talked about this, this hunt uh, on a previous podcast, but when I, this, this past 2022 deer season, it was super hot. You know, things weren't the same. But the area I was hunting, there was other variables other than the weather that weren't playing in my favor. So historical data told me that this spot was good. It was a good pinch point during the rut. Well, I hunted it three days in a row, and I didn't see a single deer. Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, that's not terribly out of the realm, but now when I, you know, so you, you start getting down on yourself. Mm-hmm. But I started looking at the variables. I checked some cameras. I hadn't had even a doe on camera in three weeks on multiple cameras in there. I'm like, Hmm, that's odd. That's not typical. Yeah, I remember that's, talking that, to you this a, year, but that's yeah. a negative, you know? Okay. They added some additional logging into this area up a little bit. Are those deer going and feeding on those tops at night? Is that why they shifted? There was some more tree stands and stuff came in mm-hmm. that were around the area. Okay. Did the pressure move them to maybe a different yeah, spot yeah. in that, particular location you know the pros were historical data told me it's there yeah it's a good terrain funnel that comes through there's historical sign there those are some pros but those cons outweighed they those did. pros yeah especially and it, it took was, me until middle of that day and the i remember day. you said that and you said i i got out and i left i got out and left, me. went to a different spot and mm-hmm. killed my buck yeah. that evening and i drove i don't know i drove probably 30 35 minutes to a completely different county and uh hunted and killed that buck and now that doesn't always work that exact way but that was one of those things where I, I felt like I gave it enough time and but when I looked at it it was like I wasn't and I realized I wasn't just being pessimistic the the the, the things were there proof was in the pudding the proof was in the pudding yeah. it told me it was time to go it was time to move and try out something differently the sign wasn't there 
things weren't going in my favor the same way. Now, that spot did fire up about seven to ten days later. Mm -hmm. Again, things maybe, you know, maybe people were hunting a lot that first week in November and some things had changed. But anyways, all of a sudden, does are back on my camera and I had rutting activity like crazy later on than than it normally was. So, you know, that that's a spot again where say I didn't fill my tag that day and I was still able to hunt. That might be something I go back in a week and check it out, you know, cuz I know it's good, but it wasn't at that time. Maybe I go check it out and do a scout through there, a quick scout on the ground, maybe I have my bow with me or whatever and get in there, check it out and maybe that situation is different. But at that time, it's like you're wasting time being here with the current situation and the cards that you're dealt. Mm -hmm. So what you were saying about um, last year when you got down and moved, um, the cons outweighed, outweighed the pros, the negatives. And, yeah. And, and that's another scenario that I will go at nighttime and check other cameras in other areas just to see – um, cause your, your rut or your time, your hunt might be short three, four days and you want to make the best of it. And you, you're, maybe your negatives outweigh your positives. I'll get down and I'll start thinking in my head, maybe I'll sit it out the rest of the day tonight. I'm going to go pull cameras and that's like, um, then you can get hot, like fresh intel. intel. Yeah. You, you know, and, and then maybe make a, make a new, um, plan for the next day and i know and i know one thing that you said too about that when you're talking about checking cameras at night and you know making the most of the time that you have but there's also a situation and you you brought it up in the, in the scouting camp today and i was like man you explained that extremely well where you're talking about when you know you can only sprint 40 yards yeah sort of deal so like when you're hunting like during the rut there's a there's a thing about putting time in and there's a, there's a, a thing about putting quality. Effect, a quality time in when you're effective. I learned this even up in Alberta when I was hunting with Jim Hole. He he wouldn't put anybody in all day sets because he said you can't be alert that whole time yeah. in that cold really cold weather. Now I'm a fan of all day sets, but what I think what you articulated about was like okay maybe I can do three to four hard days in a row and i need i need a you know maybe just a morning to sleep in break or something that recharges those batteries a little bit because you're you're down at the low battery yeah. mark and you're moving a little slower you're not as alert and you can miss opportunities or mess up opportunities based on that so for example like if you were, go, were to go in and spend three hours at nine ten o'clock at night going and checking these cameras maybe that next morning you sleep in a little bit mm -hmm. and catch up on some rest and then get full bore into it but you have that fresh intel is that kind of what what you'll do those types of things yeah or i know in a past it was going to a different state and that was my drive to another area that i got to reach and then when you get there you're pulling cameras so it's like not usually at night or the next morning and you just want to see a little bit so then it was like i got a fresh start a new place and i had time but yeah what i explained in there is like like volume and intensity kind of go hand in hand where you can't have intensity at a large quantity. It is just, it just takes a lot out of you when you're hunting to get into your spot and not, you know, mess up, get, you know, get up early, make sure your sense, right. Make sure you put your stand up, right. Make sure the winds, you know, it takes a, a, a lot. And then we talk about hunting near a Creek to where you have to be a deer will sneak up on you going to be like the whole day it's not you're on alert and sometimes i get into a place where just as i need crunchy leaves so i can just hear them coming i can kind of relax a little bit but um to be intense and on your a game and when you're hunting these tough mountain deer um you, you'll get run down trying to like i feel like you got to do everything because they don't take chances with their life man they they that's how they're survivors and and they have a lot in their favor and they don't take chances. So to capitalize on them, you, you have to be in the right spot, get the wind right, you know, be ready, be alert. And it might be getting in before light, staying late, you know, just all these things that take a toll on you mentally and physically. And that's why I like the challenge of hunting these public land or mountain bucks. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, both mentally and physically is really a, a great challenge and people um that are good at it are tough 
and work hard. You got to work hard, have a good work ethic, and it's the qualities that um, I feel like I have, you know, and other I can associate to other people that are in the same boat. You know what I mean? And doing the same thing. Yeah. So. No, you, no, you're you're spot on, and and the volume intensity thing. I mean, that comes the same thing with training your body, like working out and stuff. Like my my trainer Tom uh, Todd Baumgartner, excuse me, Human Predator Practical. I've had him on the podcast before. He talks about that a lot. He's like, you can do these, you know, workout programs that are intense, 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 and your body kind of shuts down. You start getting injured, and you start having problems. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, and he's like you know, building that, building that, you know, volume up and having that intensity when you need it, but like knowing when your body needs to recover and make sure you get that good amount of recovery to be able to continually build and do better with it. And I think that translates over to hunting quite a bit. And, you know, I, I feel like a lot, like I've done it, I've done it where I've done seven, eight days straight of all day sits and going super hard. And honestly, I feel like my effectiveness is so low yeah. at those times. I found my sweet spot is that three to four day window that I can do that. And I need a couple of days. Sometimes, sometimes it might not be that long. And if you're on like an out of state trip, I'm not going to take two days off to do that. But if I'm, <laughs> yes. you know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, but I know what I'm, you mean. It's- if I'm hunting in Pennsylvania and I'm going to pick the best days, I'm look at Spartan forage prediction. I'm look at the weather. I'm going to do that. I'm going to hunt a good three days and I need to catch up on some work. I might do that the next couple of days and then go back out and hunt again. If you're using vacation time to do that in your home state, when you're on an out of state trip, a little different, you have a little bit more condensed time. You need to make the most of it, but you can still find those recharge areas. that just might not be as long, you know, to be able to, to do that. Or maybe recharging even means just not sitting in a tree. It just means scouting yeah. a different spot. Yeah. And I, and I, like I say, when you say about the working out, grow while you rest, kind of the same applies to this um recharge and grow recharge your batteries while you're resting and sometimes for me it's just a mental thing to where instead of getting up at 4 a.m um i'll get up at 7 and it's daylight and it's a mental like i get mad at myself you should be in it in it like re twerk work something in my brain like kind of get mad at you should have been out you know and it's like sometimes all right, I'm, I, now I'm, I'm going. I got to go. You know, it's it's something like that. Just yeah. work with your, your 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 brain a little bit, kind of trick it a little bit. And to, it might not be like you said, I'm, yeah, I'm more up taking four days off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not that. It's just something, what what works for you, whether it's sleeping in or we're coming out. Okay, I'll hunt in the morning. I'm going to come out and take a nap. This or, or like, you know, you get in the rut. A lot of the times, the good time of the day is, 10 to 2 all right well i'm just gonna sleep in and go on 10 to 2 sometimes it's just that 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 helps you you know so yeah that's that's really important you, i can then you start making mistakes when, when you're going and pushing yourself um yeah no it, it 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 definitely is and 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 going back like on the the scouting side of things and and when you're doing that i mean i think that that volume comes down to the scouting portion like putting as much time as you can scouting versus the actual hunting and i feel like you'll have better hunts when you're putting in that that scouting time and also you know something that that i know all of us do you know all of us scout and hunt differently that we're at this camp Mm -hmm. but one thing that we all do is when we find particular sign and that sign doesn't need to be the biggest scrape it doesn't need to be the biggest rub whatever it is that trips our trigger that's like okay this is good it might even be this little cover this this small you know little transition um where it goes from really steep a small little bench that comes out a little knob or something wherever we find a spot that we want to hunt or sign that like gives us that thing that feels good we spend a bunch of time sitting there looking at it, walking around it, looking at it from different perspectives and trying to understand the why behind it and what's going on. And that's where you're like just taking that time instead of like trying to cover the most ground when you're scouting is like spending quality time in some yeah, of in those places areas. that matter. Mm-hmm. You know, moving quickly through areas that don't matter. Then and slow down and when then you get to that. And slow down. Really dissect an area yeah, that that's that's you really know, important it take i mean it, it'll take me if i find a spot that i think i want to set up sometimes it takes me 30 to 60 minutes to pick a tree oh yeah 
30 to now when you're when you're like running gunning and you find stuff you don't really have that amount of time like during the hunting season or focusing it but like right now in the spring that's a perfect time to spend as much time as you mm-hmm. possibly can figuring that out because there's so many scenarios it's it's super difficult to make that decision on the fly or just be like i know for me i've always been like i used to just, I'd scout 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 and i'd be i'd be running i'd find good sign i'd mark it make a waypoint and i go and then i get home and i'm like i never picked a tree yeah you don't pick a tree or like <laughs> i should and then i've replayed in it visually in my head what i saw i'm like i should have went up on that next little spot to check that or i should have dropped down i should have and maybe he's you know going to, around that point or i should i should i should have checked this you know and yeah definitely um stay in the in that zone in that area and really dissect it and know like i almost want to have a visual picture you know and when there's blank spots in there i don't like that like no. um even though i got my maps and that i want to visually run myself through that area i was and know okay he, he could be up there up the hill near that point or this and that and like i know what's all there um to help me you know because i slowed down and I, I i took it all in you know and help 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 myself fine yeah well yeah i mean greg greg, greg talked about that uh greg litzinger um a spot that him and my dad mason found and i was in this spot so i know what they're talking about there was an area where you know up on top you get this clear cut and um in this particular scenario you also had a food plot in the area but if you just even take that food plot out that clear cut kind of acts as a food plot with a bunch of briars and stuff and say there's just a food source on top whether it's mm-hmm. oaks clear cut whatever and there was a rub line that ran down off of the hill you know there's a big rub right on the edge of the food source it started going down off of the hill it's like you know where you got to your normal spot you would think a buck would bed there wasn't really bedding there and it kept going down lower and Greg was like, all right, in this situation, the food's up top, you know, then found some dough bedding. It's like the buck's probably bedding a little lower than you think. And in that particular situation, it's like, let's follow that sign down and spend time weaving back and forth Mm -hmm. and find, you know, where they're, where they're spending that time at. And, and I think adapting on the fly when you're scouting too, like you can have really good laid plans, you know, through e-scouting and, and finding these locations. But when you get in there, it's important to know when to adapt and, and, and spend more time in an area or moving back and forth and looking for those little things that, that, that make it like, okay, I think a buck's living here. I think a buck's running here, a buck's traveling here and have having that particular time of year in mind of what, when this sign is being made. Yeah. There's there's a lot that goes into your thought process for it and and for guys like us it just takes sometimes it takes a lot of asking why. Yeah, and and I always talk about no, 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 K N O W, no, no more, know where this is, no know, know as much as you can, know where they bed, know this, no, no, because he's doing the same thing, that mature deer. He's knowing all that stuff. And that's why he's successful at living, because he knows where the pressures, he knows where the does are. He knows where the food is. He knows where the, you know, car, he knows all this stuff, but he lives there every day and, and we don't, we're not in the woods every day. So you need to get closer to their level of putting time in quality time and, and knowing this and asking why I ask myself a million, how come? And then I keep going and knowing more till I can answer my questions, but it's no, 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 where the deer, no, don't just stop. Because you've seen good sign, um, probe around, know know where the guys are hunting, know where they enter, know know what the preferred food source is, you know you know know where the do- like it's just knowing you just got to be like a sponge and soak it up and know all you can, and that's that the more you know and it takes years, the you know then that's why I always people say you're kind of like a deer. I said well I kind of know the area like they do and I and I learn from them and sense what makes them comfortable, what they need, what they don't like, where are they going to be safe? How do they, you know, and I get to feel when I'm, I say I could feel a buck would walk, like I could feel what he needs when he's traveling, maybe um, ground that's uneven or just a little bit of briars or something where he could sneak or just a lot of times like yesterday or I grabbed the camera before I got up here and there was fairly open area and there was just this little soft ridge with just some thick blowdown, like, like, I could sense him, feel him 
using that just because he feels knowing that's what he likes to have when he's traveling, you know, some cover. But it's just um, being in the woods. And I told a lot of these guys, spend as much time as you can in the woods and, and learn not only from people, this guy, learn from the animals that you're hunting. That's your number, best teacher, really. You know what I mean? Is is them. Um, and ask yourself questions, like you said, why and when or or, or whatever. But they could tell you a lot, you know. Yeah, no, they 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 most definitely can, and 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 I, and I also want to say like for guys that are out there, and you're 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 trying to figure out these things, and you just think I I I can't see it the same way you guys are. I'm not yeah. I'm not putting all these pictures of the puzzle together. It takes it takes time, yeah. and just spend as much time you know st- starting small, and even if you get one piece of the puzzle together while you're out there on day scouting that's one step closer than you were before mm-hmm. and you just it t- it's going to take time and experience to understand these things and understand like okay this is where a mature buck feels would feel safe like that that is something that you can't i can't sit here and describe every scenario on what that is you know i have my own experiences that i've seen this and I apply that to other areas, and then every area I go to, I learn a little more, and I can take that information and apply it to somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, exactly. It's relative to another situation. Yeah, and but it's it's it takes time, and you know, and I say this because I'm learning it from now two years of doing this camp, of some of the same things are coming up. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm I'm struggling to you know when I get in the woods, I, I feel I feel overwhelmed or I feel confused on what this is just. Just try to slow down and ask yourself why on some of these things. And you're probably going to be wrong more than you're right, but that's okay because you will figure out more as you go. And the more experience you put in, now you've been hunting, you know, an area or just hunting a, a, a specific style like the big woods or the mountains, you know, three years, four years, five years. Now you're way further ahead than you were at the beginning. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. it's, it's, it's a lifelong process versus – uh, you know, just having an end goal for it. There's no end goal with this, you know. You just keep growing. You keep growing. And, and an analogy that I use a lot, this is how I can, people can kind of take this analogy and see how the whole hunting deer picture is, chasing mature deer. It's like, so we do talk about the pieces of the puzzle. So um, I get pieces of the puzzle, but I don't know what the big picture is. Say it's a, the puzzle you're building is a Christmas tree. So I got like some green, like, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know. It's like you building a puzzle, but not looking at the box and seeing what the picture is, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, I don't know. And that would be you harvesting the animal and knowing everything about them and killing them. It's like, that's the picture. That's what you're trying to achieve is get enough pieces of the puzzle. Then you start seeing that picture. But a lot of times I got pieces of the puzzle, but I don't know what I'm, I don't know what the end was, you know, I don't know what the picture is. Like, I don't know everything. I have pieces and I keep putting them together and learning. I got a chunk here, you know, and then I got a chunk here. And I'm, I don't know, like to me in my head, um, cause if it, I knew everything, I'd, every time I got it, I'd shoot a deer, but there's a lot you don't know. So you keep getting these puzzles and, and starting to, hopefully visualize that picture that's your end result is see the picture on the box okay i got it you know this was this was but it's just keep gaining pieces and pieces because you know i think about maybe a deer that i'm hunting or an area I'm hunting there's there's like missing it's like that puzzle you're you're putting the pieces in but all this is missing you don't know all that you're trying to fill all them pieces in and that's what you, you just keep going and going and getting a little piece here a little and you keep putting them in there and then hopefully you get enough it's almost like um i guess the wheel of fortune you don't you get letters and you don't know what the answer you know I mean, it's like can i get a you know pat can i get a j or when you know i mean you you finally get some letters and then you're like i'll solve the puzzle <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's it's like i got it but the initial start of it is just uh you know just like the wheel of fortune you know I get, can i get a p yeah, there's two P's. You're like, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Which is like, yeah, I found a couple scrapes. It's like, all right, man, I, I can put them up on a board, you know, that, yeah, so. Um. <laughs> that's, that's such a good analogy. Um, but 
kind of wrapping this up, I, uh, one thing, you know, one thing I learned is like last year, uh, well, I, had, so I had a bunch of guys had been reaching out to me that are like, you know, a lot of them are like, I, ha you know, I don't have a ton of time to put in this. I want a little bit of help or I want, I want to see some of this in person, like mm -hmm. understanding how you're looking at Johnny, how I'm looking at it, or even looking at maps of their particular area. And I started helping out, um, some guys I hadn't advertised it, but like from, a from an e-scouting perspective and like a, a consulting aspect of yeah. it basically and going through it. And basically what I was doing was like, you know, having a call with them, kind of understanding what, what the process was as far as like what's their experience in the area, what were they seeing, kind of understanding that. And then I look at the map, mark up places I want, and then have a, a call with them, like a Zoom call, and go mm -hmm. through and try to help them understand it and see it and learn, you know, helping mark points for them, but also teaching them the process at the same time. And recently you you're starting to help people with that, yeah. you know, from an e-scouting perspective and you know, you're, you've had so much experience and you're like, I want to help others to be able to learn how to do that. You know, whether that's e-scouting or even in the field scouting and yeah. being able to, to see that and almost be like a coach <laughs> yeah, exactly, um, yeah. to, to be able to help with that. So you want to talk a little bit more about what you're kind of doing there? Yeah. So all the years experience being in a lot of different States, um, I, I, I come to the conclusion. It's like, I could be helping people. I, I have helped people just message me, but it got to the point where I can't help everybody. And your, t my time is v valuable, you know? So, um, but the biggest thing is help. I, I want to help others, um, from all my experience. I want to, I want to give them uh, what I've learned and not have them maybe take 20 years to get to where I am. Maybe I could help them along, speed the process up. So, and then it hit me when we were, uh, on a trip in Alabama this year. I, and I think we take not so, um, I don't want to say for granted. We, we, we know a lot. Um, but we are still learning. We don't, like I said, I don't, sometimes I, the more I learn, the more I want to learn more. And I feel like I don't know, but I think I'm so, far down the road compared to the average guy getting into hunting because I spent all that time out there. Um, but I forget where I was going. Um, but I, I want to, I started help. Well, anyways, I, I have started helping people, um, e-scouting, dropping pins. Um, and because there was a, um, definitely a need for it just over the years, people contact me. Um, but I'm, I'm going to do more. I want to do more to help people. Um, and like I said, my time is valuable. So yeah. lately, I like lately I have been helping a few guys. Um, I drop pins for them, just e-scouting and send them out and, and they check the areas, check the pins and they come back and, and it could be like evolving to where, like you said, I can go out in uh, in the field and hike with them maybe an area that that um cuz i feel like when you're e scouting there there's a lot missing boots on the ground is is really a big thing and you could see more just being out there but um yeah so i have been helping people scout uh dropping pins and i and like after this um camp i've had people come up to me and like you said it, it's like people are willing to pay for your time to help help them you know so, um, and I'm going to keep doing, like, I've, I've been busy with my excavation business here the last couple of months, but I'm getting freed up and, and I'm going to start, um, like I, I talked to you, Bo, about, Hey, let's talk about it maybe on a podcast or something and get it out there. And, and, uh, cause I'm, I'm having people contact me now to where, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of working out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, yeah, and, and, and you want to work with people that, that want to learn and want to, you know be able to elevate that you think about it like anything i want to learn um the fast track to doing that is essentially trying to learn from somebody else that's done it that's mm -hmm. done these things and that you can learn from and i've and through the years i've paid for services to have or not even i don't know if you want to call them services but i've paid to have access to people that have done it yeah and 
to try to learn from them to be able to apply to my own scenario. And I think that's a, a really good, you know, thing. You know, one, one of the guys that was here, I had helped him out with e-scouting. We did a consulting thing and then he came to the camp to add another aspect to it, to get to spend time with all yeah, of us yeah, yeah. in person and be able to elevate. And, you know, just talking to him, he was like, man, I'm, you know, some of the sign that he was finding. And there, there was a couple of people here that had helped out with consulting before and it, it helped out. And I think someone like you that, that has had such experience in not only big woods, but farm country yeah, yeah, that, and, different habitats and, and stuff, so yeah. many different habitats all over the country, y- you have this, all this information and being able to help someone else. So if someone were to like, want to talk to you about it and see if it was the right fit like what should how should they contact you so you can just uh if you can uh, message me on instagram or um email me stuart14967 at gmail if you want to shoot me you know uh an email um and we can get something going um in every situation i don't want to say what it costs them but every sit it depends on what, what you're wanting to do um but what I was wanting to say before I lost my train of thought is that um, we take so much for granted of what we know because we're around guys that are doing this, you know, and, and we're learning a little bit, little bit. But, you know, in the recent veteran hunts that Bill had, I was able to get with in the woods with people that are more novice. And and I really, like, they, they're, like, blown away in what they learn in the day or two in the woods. And, and they all, and this is another thing that triggered me to help people is, like, I learned more with you in these two days than I would learn in two years. And I'm going to, you know, the gears started turning in my head. I'm like, wow, this, this could be a definitely a business venture for me to just help people. Cause I love helping people. And, and if I had enough money and I was rich, I'd help everybody for free, but that ain't the case. You know, your yeah. time is valuable. But the, the recent hunt we had in Alabama, I, I went to an area that I never been before, but like you said, being in different parts of the country, and I just, I seen right away where the, where the doe population was, where the deer, you know, and, and I just, things started clicking and, and, and I, you know, Slade Johnson, we were on some of his property and, and I just, um, he was wanting, you know, we had corn and we were hunting over feeders and doe and, and, and shooting hogs and stuff like that. But I'm always tuned into mature deer and, um, he told us where to park and hunt. And I went with, um, Jake, uh, a newer hunter and, and, uh, and we hunted and, and on the, where we were parking, it just, I just felt, um, it was an old homestead. I just felt like this is where a big deer, there's some mature trees, there, some oak trees an old grown up homestead. I'm like, this is where I would hunt for a mature deer, you know, and we're in the rest and they're usually loners. And the rest of the population is the doe and the yearlings, a lot of deer. And that's where we were going to try to harvest some of these does and stuff. But on the way out the one day, at 11 o'clock we were getting back to the vehicle going back toward this homestead and we're almost like to this old homestead where we were parked and along the road and i just could i, I, I said jake get ready he said what do you mean said, i said no this is where a big buck and you start your sixth sense your senses get really in tune with where you're at and all your experience i said no this is where a big buck's gonna be right here and like he knocked an arrow and we walked. I'm like, hold up, there he is, right? And he was standing right there, and he 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 caught us. And he Jake was blown away. How did you know that? I just I sensed like this is, I feel like this is what a deer needs. That, that was just a buck like, and that's what I say about putting all the time in the woods and learning and like almost becoming that animal and and knowing what you need to survive and get old. Like I like so I start sensing what what they need and, and i'm in the, in an area like like this is this is an area for big deer so he was blown away and, and i'm just like and i talked to slade and i said hey uh he said yeah i hunted that property i said man you got to be up near that homestead there's a big he said yeah i hunted down in a barn one year uh, years ago there's a big deer there he said guess where i found a shed i said where he said right in the yard at a homestead he's living i was like yeah but it was like i was there one time studied a little bit of e-scout and i went in and it's like and, I'm, and, it, and it made me feel good to go into a different area. And like, man, I knew right away, like this, and, and people, I don't know, have that sense maybe, or I, I, like I said, when I was younger, I didn't learn, like I quit reading magazines and stuff like that. And it didn't really pertain where I, to where I hunted. So I just would learn from the animals themselves and spend all that time in the woods and see what they want. So 
that's where my my wheels started spinning even more and getting into this year and and I talked about it on another podcast and I had a couple guys contact me and and so yeah I've been doing some e-scouting dropping pins and and they're just ecstatic and I and I think um you know when it's when you're passionate about something like that money's not a, you're, you're gonna hunt and you, you want to um jump in leaps and bounds and, and I feel like I could help people in, in in that way for for a price tag whatever it might be um but if you would take 10 years to learn this stuff if we could speed up this process to you know and in 10 years what's going to cost you to go to these different states due to scouting so yeah um yeah shoot me a um message on in, the johnny stewart on instagram or like i said i shoot me an email um and and we could talk like I, i've been having like a 10 minute consultation what do you want what, what do you need what are you wanting to do um it usually starts with some e-scout and pin drop and um but then we can get more in depth where i mean that's really like bottom of the barrel like what i would do um for a price tag is, is just drop some pins and and I would describe them a little bit to a certain degree and go about your way, but we can get more in depth to where um, I have you go to these areas, take pictures um, and, and send them to me um, because, you know, like e-scout and you can't see all the cover. There's a lot of factors, but, but then we can get into like, okay, where, do, where, where, do, where's access, you know, where are people coming in where, you know, there's like a, the kind of a, a list in my head that I, I think I'm going to end up, writing up a list of what I want to boom, shoot at you, you know, boom. Um, it's something when, when you, when we start talking and I, I think as I do more of it, I'm going to have this, I, I thought about, it, I'm going to have a list. I'm going to shoot you off these five things that I need to know from you, you know, right. But, but it's not, um, it might not pertain to every situation. Cause like we said earlier, every, and, and another thing that I feel like I could help being in a bunch of different States and learn a lot is like, there are new, no two situations alike. They're all different. You know, similarities do come into play, but nothing is identical. There's no two pieces of land. You know, it's just to where I feel like me having experience, I could help help people and in, in, in jump in leaps and bounds this way. Yeah, and, you're, so, and, um, and you were saying that you wanted to, like, ideally it would be like a scenario where you'd continue to work with this person like you mm. start with the drop and pins maybe you know maybe you don't even go visit the property but they go in they find stuff they schedule another call with you talking about what they found and okay maybe you adjust some what you're looking at a map based on what they found helping them through it and even coming down to the season when they're yeah. struggling and going through like oh hey maybe you can think about you know trying this or going down to this method just kind of like a, a coaching type set yeah being like i feel like maybe a quarterback you're the quarterback i'm the coach on the sidelines and we're going to play this game and i think i would like get to the situation where okay i'm going to coach you through the season as your coach you're the quarterback you're playing and you come to the sidelines which is you give me a call here what do i need to do because i feel like uh scouting this time of year dropping pins is one one thing that i could do but as we evolve and go through the season um if someone's you know like and we talk about how we have friends that we could bounce things off of because we grew up with hunters but there's some guys that are getting this new and they don't have people that they can call hey bo um i got this situation what do you think i do and, and almost they need that coach or someone throughout the season so i'm thinking i might take on something to that effect to where like you know in season um changing on a fly what are you seeing how you know so i think it could really have people jump in leaps and bounds, actually see what I see and have them um, talk to me like, okay, I'll catch up with you. Um, you know, it's dark at five during, the, you know, you have a few hours maybe. Um, so that's a, that's like a scenario I'm thinking about setting up. If, if people are interested in going that route and having me there available for them. Yes. I'm doing my own hunting and I know other guys only I've talked to a few guys to, doing a consultant they just want to do it in the scouting summertime because they're doing their own their hunting season they're doing their thing they want to be bothered but i think i think there's people that could really have someone pay to have someone on call to 
John, I, I jumped this deer. Uh, what do you think I should do? Where go? And then if it's already, we started back in the spring or summer, and we already got a track record. And I could, it's just basically like that coach on the sideline to, to, to watch it. So like your coach on a football team, he's got a lot of experience and he can see it from, you know, and we always talk about having someone else's, someone else's perspective, point of view, but I can call you, I can call other friends and, and go that route. But, um, and I, and I think about different things, maybe get into maybe um, having someone come hunt with me if, if they wanted to, maybe we get together. Like I'm just playing things in my head that things I would like to do is maybe um, say, Bo, you're, you're wanting a, a scouting, me to help you scout or, or man, I'd really love for you to come down and it's hike, hike, hike that area or, or um, hunt my area or, Maybe I'll take them to one of my areas. Maybe I'll work in, into something like that. But it's all individually different on what someone's wanting. We'll just have to work on a price and figure out what, what you're comfortable with and, and, and me to, to, to make it happen. But I think I'd like to, as I took people out for these veteran hunts, I'd like to get into that, like taking people out or hunting with them um, throughout the year, hunt together. And like even a couple of the guys I've been doing some scouting, for, come on down. I said, well, maybe we'll, I'll come down and hunt with you and, you know, a day with me, like I learned from them guys and veterans. I'm just like, man, I can't believe it. But we, I'm like humble. I don't stick my, like I know everything because I don't, you know, but I feel like other people looking at me like, wow, I can't believe what you know to where th this could de definitely benefit them. So there's a lot, a lot of things I'm playing around with in my head, um, different ways of helping people. But yeah, if, if yeah. someone's interested in it, yeah, get a hold of me and, and um, it will go from there. Just, you know, have like a little consultation, a couple of minutes on the phone and see what we can come up with, you know. And like you said, a couple of guys here contacted me. Give me your number. I want to maybe get into some consulting. And, and like you said, uh, a lot of some of these guys are traveling two, three hours. And, you know, when you get out there and you want to know, no, no, but they don't have the time and they're green and not knowing a lot about it, like where something I could really have them jump in leaps and bounds and, and, and help them find that animal yeah no and, and and then eventually be able to you know kick the bird out of the nest sort of deal and like they're yeah to you're go right yeah on their own that's the the end goal with it but no i think uh i think that's pretty awesome and and uh and, it, and to me it makes so much sense like the time i've spent if i could be around someone that knew what i knew when i was younger and talk to them i could probably get further ahead and i, I know to me you're young yet Bo, but you're jumping because almost you're getting when you do these podcasts you're talking to you get all these different aspects from other but you, and, and you know i look up to you and what you know cause with all the people you've had to be around in, in in this uh career field that you're in now and being with your dad it's like it's kind of the same deal you could you can really get further ahead you know in, in these um scenarios yeah no definitely well, John, I appreciate you coming on and talking and helping out with the scouting camp oh, yeah. again. It was uh, it was a phenomenal time, and uh, I look forward to planning the next one and continuing to evolve this and make it better, and just be able to have you know good times with good people with similar interests. Yeah, I appreciate you having me, Bo, and and I think we're both on the same page. We want to help people. And yeah, like you said, we, we even after the camp, we all got together and had some different ideas on how we could make it better and, you know, other avenues that we could go down, you know. Definitely. Cool. Well, uh, I guess we'll we'll talk to you later. And thanks, everyone, for listening. We will talk to you soon. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.